if your view is that the last year and a half has been a departure point and we have set new destinations for ourselves because of what we now believe is possible and what has shifted, it's a very different discussion. Welcome to Series 3 of the Future Health Podcast, a podcast on the way we work, the work we do, and how technology will influence the future of work in New South Wales Health and the healthcare industry. We have an incredible lineup of guests this series, and we look forward to sharing it with you soon. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again to our show. Um, our guest today is Dr. Jeff Schwartz, retired senior partner at Deloitte and US leader of Future of Work. He continues to advise, um, stay on as a senior advisor at Deloitte, and his passion is workforce, business transformation, talent and leadership. So I'm very interested in learning more about the future of work and what um, his thoughts are in the public sector space. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I was hoping you'd be able to do a little bit of an introduction for the audience so they can get to know you from your point of view. Absolutely. Really delighted to be with you uh, today as we're recording. It's evening here in New York, and I think it's morning um, in uh, in Australia. So it's terrific to be able to, to work the global clock as we are. Um, I am a retired partner at Deloitte. I spent 20 years uh, as a consulting partner there. Um, worked all over the world, the U.S., um, India, um, uh, Israel um, uh, as well. And uh, in addition to advising Deloitte and my work leading the future of work practice there, I'm currently working with a, a startup, an Israeli startup called Gloat, working on talent marketplaces. And yes, there is a big difference between working for the world's leading and largest consulting firm, Deloitte, and working for a a startup with a couple of hundred people around the world. And I'm also very fortunate. I, I teach um, at the graduate business schools, both at Columbia University and Cornell University in New York. Um, and perhaps most interesting and relevant for our discussion today, um, earlier this year, I, I published my first book um, called Work Disrupted, Opportunity, Resilience and Growth in an Accelerated Future of Work. And I'm sure we'll be touching on that during our discussion today. So again, really glad to be with you. Yeah, it's it's um it's really great to have um someone of your experience, you know, who's clearly um lived through different futures of work, I suppose. You know, that's that's what we're hoping for for all of our guests is, you know, we've all lived through different futures of work and the future changes. So Let's dive straight into it, I think. And I, I, I guess my first um, thought was let's address the elephant in the room. Let's talk about COVID because clearly that has been a global disruptor. It has fundamentally changed our world. Um, and, you know, some people believe we're never going back. So interested to hear your thoughts about the after effect of COVID and what have you seen in terms of the significant changes? Um, has COVID accelerated the way we think about the future of work? And or, or, or are we leaving just leaving some ways of working behind? What, what are your thoughts? So we could we could spend the entire hour just <laughs> on this question. Um, let me share some thoughts, and and I'll uh, hopefully we can all warm up in uh, thinking about it. Um, we've all, thank God, many who the, anybody listening to this podcast so far has lived through COVID. Um, not everybody has. It's been uh, it has clearly been a, a health crisis and an economic crisis. And uh, in many parts of the world, including my own country, the US, there have been associated social crises. Um, as I like to say, um, Sarisha, um, we're all futurists now, right? So often when I'm in an interview like this, someone says, Jeff, you're, you're a futurist. You've been studying the future of work for 10 years. You know, what's gonna happen? And the interesting situation today is because we've all lived through and it's more than an acceleration. We've lived through this period of the last year and a half. It's going on in January. It'll be two years. Um, the day we're recording this, one of the largest companies in the world, Apple, um, just announced that their return to work date is January 2022. So that's, that's two years since the beginning of the COVID crisis uh, in the world, certainly 
um, in Asia. And I've been very fortunate uh, for any of us who've been to the to the Apple campus. It's one of the most beautiful, engaging physical work environments in the world. But Apple and many of us around the world who could work virtually are working virtually. Um, I do not think that the extended COVID experience, and unfortunately it really is, we're, we're in what I would describe as the extended recovery. At Deloitte, we have talked about responding to COVID, recovering from COVID, and then thriving after COVID. The recovery phase has taken much, much longer than any of us imagined in the winter and the spring. I'm in the Western, I'm in the Northern Hemisphere um, of, uh, of, of, um, of 2020. Um, it's, not, it's not really only an acceleration story. It's an acceleration story, but it's really a, a shift story. It really is a disruption story. And as many people have probably said on this show and others in discussions, most of the trends that we have seen played out over the last year and a half were trends that were in motion before COVID. But we went to a whole other level of intensity in terms of what happened. And I'll, I'll sort, of, uh, sort of end with these two observations as we're kicking off. We've been talking about acceleration and how technology is accelerating our lives since about the early 1960s. I mean, for people who sort of know the, the technology history, it was Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, who postulated what we many of us refer to as, it's referred to as Moore's Law, the observation that tech, technology effectively doubles or halves in price every 18 to 24 months. So technology has been doubling for about 60 years. That's 30 doublings, right? If you do the math, it's sort of an amazing calculation. It really helps us understand exponential change. So we've been accelerating for a long time. But in the last year and a half, we've seen 10x changes, right? And I'll just give two examples that will bring this uh, to the forefront. One is around remote work and virtual work. If I look at the data around the world, I, the U.S. data is at my fingertips, but I think it's, it's fairly representative of many parts of the world. Roughly four to five percent of the population, the working population in the U.S. before COVID was sometimes working from home. Teleworking is what we used to call it. By May of 2020, which is last May, not this past May, the May before this May, that number was about 50 percent. Effectively, if you could work remotely and virtually, you were. And you, if you didn't, you had to be physically and socially distant. I just want to remind, I keep reminding myself, I'd like to remind our listeners, that's 10x. We went from 4 to 5% to 50% in a matter of weeks in most part of the world. The other 10x example that I think is right in front of us is what we saw in terms of vaccine development. Now, if you, if you literally Google or search how long does it take to create a vaccine, it will show you a chart. I mean, I mean, I was sort of amazed to see this. That shows it takes about 10 years to develop a vaccine, right? But And yet, multiple countries and researchers around the world in 2020 developed vaccines, effective vaccines, in less than a year, right? So we are seeing this 10x play out. And I think the challenge that we're, we're having right now, and I'll sort of and the introduction with this comment. I do not see the COVID experience as a detour, right? I think the, the, the stories that we tell, the pictures that we use to tell the stories are very important. Some, some business leaders especially, and some government leaders, I think for many months have been thinking that COVID is a detour. We're on the service road or we're on the road running next to the highway. It's called different things in different parts of the world. And they're just waiting to get back on the highway, right? I don't think that this is about getting back on the highway. I think that this is about picking a new direction, right? Based on where we've been traveling over the last 18 months. And that hopefully will help frame some of our discussion today. What are the new options that we have many of which were because COVID pushed us into a new way of working, a new way of living, a new way of integrating our work and our personal lives. 
Yeah. And I mean, and that, that's, that's an interesting point you make there about, you know, talking about it in terms of a detour versus, I guess, many people want to look at it as an opportunity um, to use some of the acceleration, like your example of times 10, you know, to then be able to pivot forward. So I'd be interested to delve a little bit into one of the examples you mentioned there about working from home and remote working because uh, clearly that was a, a powerful example there where you you know you talked about 5% of the population and 50%. So what in what have you what has been I mean other than the fact that we had to obviously with the pandemic do you think there were other triggers for organizations to sort of say well actually we we have to make this happen but now now that we've made it happen what can we do to sustain it? Yeah, so th this, when we look at the different dimensions of the future of work that have been accelerated and shifted forward um, during the COVID era, you know, we often talk about the future of the work itself, the future of the workforce, and the future of the workplace. This one piece that we're talking about now, the future of the workplace, was really dramatically moved into a whole new way of operating. Um, you know, I remember, um, Sarisha, in April and May of 2020, this is 18 months ago, 20 months ago, working with companies, and we were planning for going back to the office in July of 2020, right? Um, and then, you know, we then realized it wasn't going to be July, maybe it was going to be September. And I think we all know the story. I mean, the the, the, the example we used in the, in the U.S. is Groundhog Day. I mean, you, you know, we keep coming back to the starting point, right? We thought we were making progress, but we, um, we keep starting again. We've been working virtually for, in many parts of the world, significant percentages of the workforce for a year and a half going on, on two years. This is not a temporary shift, right? It's been fascinating to listen to the dialogue and to hear the perspectives and the opinions of business leaders and government leaders and individual workers and their families and their friends and colleagues. Um, and are there challenges personally um, on the, the employee side, the worker side of virtual and remote work? There, there are, right? But interestingly, I think on balance, there is a real pull from workers and employees to really find a way to take this flexibility. We were joking as we were getting started about, you know, the cats and the dogs and our children and the and the and the service delivery people that are that are interrupting our work and our our recordings as we're doing uh, today. But we've been able to integrate our personal lives and our our work lives in a way that we really could not do before. At least here in the U.S., when I talk to people around the world, not everybody is looking forward to that commute back to the office um, um, and what that means. And so I think the, the challenge that we have now is much less about should we go back to the office, should we not go back to the office? Should we be hybrid Should and where should we be on this continuum? But rather, and, and Linda Gratton, who's a fantastic professor at the London Business School, had the lead article in a Harvard Business Review in May and uh, June. And the title of the article was, I'm pretty sure I have it right, um, um, Making Hybrid Work or Doing Hybrid Right, right? And I think what we're trying to figure out, both from the employee side and from the business and government leader side, what are the leadership and management and personal practices that we can change in order to really get the value out of the flexibility and the opportunities to work remotely? I think in a sense, I'll summarize it this way. I think we've, many companies have put too much effort into figuring out, do we come back and how many days a week do we come back? And not enough effort into how do we help our team leaders and our managers at every level in the organization effectively coach and manage and work with teams, sometimes where we're in the same physical location, sometimes where we're going back and forth, and sometimes we're members of our teams for a lot of reasons, including children and taking care of 
of um, parents, you know, are very, very talented people who being able to work from home really enables us to access their talents. Uh, so interesting, um, Jeff, there, and I'll pick up on what you said about flexible working, because I think, you know, people talk about working from home, but they sort of forget that flexibility can apply in a range of settings, particularly from New South Wales Health's perspective. Most of the healthcare workforce um, is not in a position to be working from home. There are elements and, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts around um using virtual care or telehealth, but fundamentally, most of the health workforce and some other areas such as teachers and police, they're very much front facing and they, they can't do their jobs working from home. So what are your thoughts around the future of work for those workforces and what does flexibility mean for them? Yeah. So I, I love this question. Uh, the health question is a very interesting one. Um, I know it's, it's uh, really the the focus of, of, uh, of this podcast and the work that you're doing. I have a slightly different view on the workplace question and how we think about virtual or hybrid or on-premise. And, and there's no question, uh, my, my sister and brother, my sister is a practicing physician. She teaches at a medical school. She's a clinician. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very aware of, uh, from my own personal family experience, um, what it's been like to continue working, both teaching medical students and interns and residents, but also um, seeing a, a, a patient load, as my sister and brother-in-law do as, as doctors in Chicago. Um, but I, I think the question that we're highlighting, which is how do we manage a workforce that's probably doing much more telehealth than we were doing before, right? Um, and how do we integrate technology into the way that we're actually working when we're in clinical settings. I think it's a shift. I'm sure that people listening to this have been focused on that. Early on in 2020, um, we looked at the growth of telehealth in the U.S. and in a number of countries in Asia. It was very interesting, Sarisha. It didn't matter what your, what your baseline was, because in the U.S., the baseline was pretty low, right? I mean, uh, we were not big consumers of telehealth. Our insurers and our regulators were not big proponents of telehealth. Um, and yet the numbers showed that from the um, sort of April, uh, May period of 2020 to the ending months of 2020, we saw a tenfold increase in telehealth in the United States. In China, which also has some inter very interesting data, they started at a much higher base. They actually have a, a, a pretty robust telehealth and virtual health industry, I would describe it that way, or, or service sector. But even though they started, or it's interesting, they started at a higher level, they also had a tenfold increase um, uh, in telehealth. So I, I do think that there's an opportunity to, to look at that. I think we're also seeing some really interesting opportunities where technology is being used um, to support uh, community hospitals and community clinics and, and um, uh, clinics that are in second and third and fourth tier cities all around the world to have access to specialists and monitoring that is in other cities in the same country or in, um, uh, or in, uh, or in similar time zones. So I, I don't want to count out the role of technology, whether it's in telehealth or in education. Um, but in both cases, we're looking at new combinations. Right. And, and what they have in common is in most of the areas when we talk about the future of work and the future of the workplace, if we reflect on the experiences of the, of the last year and a half, the work that we're doing is changing because of the combination of how people and technology are working together. Right. And we can go into this. We've done some, I'll call it interesting research looking at the role of what we call super jobs and super teams um, and how technology is helping us to do things that we could not do as individuals or as teams of people before. And I think that really is part of the story um, as well, right? I think the work that we're doing, but the audience will be much better experts to ascertain this, the work that we're doing um, in clinics and in hospitals, certainly in research, is different because of the way we're interacting with technology um, and the way that we can use telehealth, not for everything, 
but for a much more significant percentage of what we do, um, of what we're doing. And we need to figure out, this goes to the management practices question, how do we integrate telehealth, collaborative research with the people that are in the clinics, in the hospitals, and in the laboratories? Mm, yeah. Well, so um, following on from that then, because yes, I, I fully agree with you. I think um, there's there's been... Um, significant developments even here in Australia with regard to the use of telehealth and the recognition from people that telehealth is an acceptable way in some situations of getting care from patient point of view and also providing care from a clinician point of view. So what do you think is the best way to go about having or, you know, implementing that mindset shift for clinicians, because I think sometimes the struggle we have in health is there is a set way of doing things. And, you know, like you said, we change for a pandemic, but then we may go back to the old way because we think we need to get back on the highway, so to speak. So what would you say from your point of view or what advice would you give around fundamentally shifting the way we, we work or thinking about what the right way is to do work in the future? This is a fantastic question, and in an interesting way, um, in an interesting way, this is the the thesis of the book that I wrote that I published earlier this year. And I'm a I'm an author, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my book. And as I mentioned, the book's titled "Work Disrupted," and the thesis of the book, effectively, if I were to summarize it in one line, which is very hard if you're an author to summarize your book in one line, because I do want people to buy and read the book. But if I were to summarize the book in one line, I would say that the challenge that we have, and this was before COVID, COVID has certainly moved us into, um, uh, moved us really ahead. The challenge that we have is that we cannot lead and manage 21st century work and careers and use 20th century maps and mindsets and mental models. And yet many business leaders and many public sector leaders and many individual workers are using simply outmoded and outdated mental models. You sort of, you know, to quote um, Marshall Goldsmith, you can't get there from here if you use the wrong model, right? Um, and the question of how we frame the question itself, um, uh, you know, not to make a detour, but just to give a, a sort of an interesting little tidbit to the people listening. Um, one of the themes of 2021 so far, if you look at some of the great books that have been written, and not my, I'm not talking about my book, right? Adam Grant wrote a book called Think Again. Um, Jillian Tett, who's the, one of the leading editors of the Financial Times, wrote a book called Anthrovision on how to view the world as an anthropologist. Um, fantastic book. Um, a couple of editors uh, and professors in um, the UK and France wrote a book called The Framers, right? Literally talking about how you frame the problem and reframe the problem makes possible what you can actually get done and how you can motivate yourself and other people. We are in a reframing moment, right? We're in a moment where we get to ask the question, are these the right mental models? Right. And I'll just give I'll give one example. And if you want, we can go into others. Um, one of my favorite examples to sort of highlight why the frame we pick is so important is the frame that we use and the mental model that we use when we think about what is a career. Right. There's a wonderful article in the New York Times uh, literally the last week that said what people want are not jobs. What people want are careers. It sort of raises the question, what is a career? Right. Well, a career for our parents, you know, who came of age in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when they were in the height of their work, a career was based on what we used to call a three box model. You get training and education. You go to work for an organization. You get on a career ladder. You enter the you know, you enter as a junior, doc you enter as a, st a medical student, then you become a junior doctor, then you become a physician, then maybe you become a, a more senior consultant. And, you know, a small number of people move into executive roles. A almost every track has some type of a linear career progression. And then you retire, right? You do that for 25, 30 years. It, literally, in my book, we, we, we retell the story of the gold watch, which was 
um, literally introduced by Pepsi, the, the, comp- the consumer goods company in the United States in the 1930s. You worked for us for 30 years. We literally gave, they gave people a gold watch. The point, Sarisha, is that that mental model of you do some training, you get into a linear career track, work, your career progression is relatively predictable, then you retire, and retirement used to mean you stopped working, right? It doesn't mean that anymore. Now we have yeah. ideas like encore careers and, and, and similar, uh, third, the third phase of life, et cetera. Um, but we know that that's not what our careers are anymore, right? We know that because the demographers tell us that the generation that's starting work today, the 20-year-olds joining the workforce in 2021, can expect to live to be 100, some of them, right? They'll literally live. We are hiring people today, and you are in Australia, we are in, in the U.S., and we are hiring people today who are starting their careers who will be around in the year 2100, right? So we have to be thinking about what does it mean to plan lives and careers that are much longer. We're not going to work for 20 or 30 years. We may work for 40, 50, 60 years. And yet the average time in a job or a position around the world is three or four years and dropping in in many industries. And the half-life of a technical skill, right, is is decreasing. It used to be you could learn a technical skill. Again, my sister is a doctor and, you know, I mean, it's fascinating to talk to people who are in healthcare or people who are in computer science because, the things that the tools we're using and the data that we're using and the information changes so quickly, we are constantly reinventing ourselves. And and I think that's the point, right? Which is careers are not three chapters, three boxes and you're done. Careers are portfolios of lifelong reinvention, right? And if we think about careers as portfolios of lifelong reinvention, how does that influence the way that we help develop careers for people in healthcare, the way that we develop careers for people who are doing working in different parts of the healthcare system, the administrative side, the um, uh, um, the clinical side, the research side, most of our models are not based on this hundred year life, this portfolio of reinvention. But look, I have a twenty seven year old and a twenty nine year old daughter, and you know we're trying to help them figure out how to live these portfolio lives and what we can do institutionally. So it's part of the way that we, that we work. So the mindset piece is very important. And this is the piece that really challenges us as leaders because leaders and managers get to choose the frame and they get to reframe and organizations that, and I'll go back to where we started the question. If your frame is that we're gonna get back onto the old highway you're signaling to your organization and your customers and your patients a certain view of the world. If your view is that the last year and a half has been a departure point and we have set new destinations for ourselves because of what we now believe is possible and what has shifted, it's a very different discussion. And you can hear the energy in my voice as I talk about it, I hope. Yeah, I, I definitely can. I'm I'm not sure I'm 100% on board living to 100. And <laughs> it was a bit of a depressing thought there for me if I, uh, but you know, that's another story. I do see what you mean, though. And I guess what, what you're talking about there. So um, we're, uh, we're, we're close to wrapping up, but I just want to ask you one final question and expand on that. Uh, a lifelong journey. What about lifelong learning? How does how does education fit into all of this? Because clearly, we have certain ways we educate the workforce, and how how do we pivot and shift that in order to to adapt to the twenty year olds who will be coming out and you know having multiple careers? No, I, I I love this question, and I'm going to try to tie together this question on education with one of the ways that um, uh, I close the book. The last three chapters in my book talk about roadmaps for us as individuals and roadmaps and maps for us as individuals, as business and organization leaders, and as citizens and members of societies and communities, right? And we all have those three personas. We all play leadership roles. We all play roles as individuals. And we all play roles as members of communities and and society. Um, It was a a very fun and interesting part of the the book to write. 
And and in the in the section, the, the the first of those chapters talks about the mindsets for us as individuals, right? And, and the first one, and it will be no surprise to you, it will be no surprise, hopefully, to the listeners of this podcast, is the importance of a growth mindset, right? The worth of Carol Dweck, the um, the psychologist. There are similar psychologists who've looked at this around um, around the world. If we come from the perspective that that we are growing, if we come from the perspective that the world is not finite, that we can reframe, that we can learn and actually improve, that mindset, the growth mindset is absolutely essential, right? Um, the mindset that we get to live long and winding lives, I, you know, re reflecting on the song from the Beatles for people who remember who the Beatles were, right? And interesting, when I said that we get to live to be 100, maybe not us, but maybe our, my, my kids, Half the world groans and half the world says, yay. <laughs> right, right? It's like, what do you mean, Jeff? I have to work for 50 or 60 years, right? Um, and, and I think there are, there are, there are other challenges just for, for us um, as individuals, mindset shifts. I think the role of how we work with teams is absolutely a critical mindset. And when I say how we work with teams, Sarisha, I don't only mean how we lead teams, but all the different roles that we play on teams, being a participant, being an expert, being a process facilitator. I mean, we play many roles um, on teams and the better we are at teaming, the better we are at this much longer portfolio of life. And I'll mention two others just to complete the story. One is, and we touched on this, how as individuals and obviously organizations and communities how we actually integrate and use technology versus competing with technology, right? I think one of the big challenges we have, one of the fundamental questions in the future of work is do we view technology and people in a substitution arrangement? Is automation about taking out away work from the work that people do? Or is it, and I'll use um, um, an expression from uh, a leading physician in the United States, um, Eric Topol, Dr. Eric Topol, wrote a book, I'm sure many of your listeners have read, called Deep Medicine on healthcare and AI. Um, and Eric, I interviewed Eric for my book, and he introduced to me one of the most interesting phrases, and this is sort of where I'm going to conclude, um, in all these discussions. And he has a chapter in his book where he talks about the role that AI plays relative to radiologists, right? a, a very familiar story to many of us. And he says, look, when we first started talking about this three, four or five years ago, many people said we won't need radiologists anymore because the algorithms can read the digital images and scans as well or better than the average or even above average radiologist. And what Eric challenges us, and I think this is really the, the, the really interesting question for the 2020s, is he asked the question, what is a Renaissance radiologist? What does a Renaissance radiologist do? What does a radiologist do when she stands on the shoulder of the technology? Not when she's competing with the technology, right? And how does a radiologist, how does she, how does he, how do they use the gift of time that we have as medical and healthcare practitioners, because most medical and healthcare practitioners don't have enough time to do many of the things they want to do, right? How are we going to use the gift of time, right? So that question, what's the Renaissance version of what we do, right? And how can we work with technology, both for our own jobs, that's what we call super jobs. How do I become a super performer? Because I can stand on the shoulders of the technology. And how do I create a super team? Because together, we can use technology and the way that we work together to accomplish things that we couldn't before. To me, that's really one of the big questions of the, of the 2020s, which is what's the Renaissance version of the work that we do? And how do we use hybrid work? How do we use workforce changes? How do we use the globalization of, of, of um, talent? And how do we use the, the combination of people and technology to simply see further, this is a clear reference to the audience, and move farther than we did before. What's the Renaissance view of what we're trying to do? 
That's that's a beautiful thought. And I love the idea of the gift of time because I think we would all love the gift of time. And you, you're spot on, particularly in healthcare. Um, I think that's all we have time for, unfortunately. I would love to talk to you for hours, Jeff. Clearly, um, you, you have amazing passion and experience in this area. So once again, thank you so much for your time. I know it's been a long day for you doing this in the US, but we really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, looking forward to uh, continuing our our uh, engagement in the future. Thank you so much. I am too. Thank you. It's really been enjoyable. It's been fun. So that's all we have time for this episode. Thanks for joining me on the show. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure to like, share and subscribe on whatever platform you're on right now. 